Uh, I mean, it's pretty, I worked, when, so I mean, I, it's well known and part of why I'm so open about this is that I think it gives permission for other people just to be honest. Um, I grew up in a very kind of dysfunctional household um, on welfare and that compounded a bunch of shit in my life that was not great. Um, we were very focused on money. Um, it was a huge point of pressure and tension in the family. It created massive depression in my father, drinking, just, it was very dysfunctional. And there was some point along the way where I was like, okay, is money like really important or not important? And I feel very lucky because I don't think if you ask my sisters, they got to the same place that I did. Um, but I ended up not coveting it. And I found it to be uh, something that I could use to really empower myself to do the things that I wanted to do. And so in a situation where, you know, you go to a, like a restaurant, if you really empathize with the people that are working there, I see people who are like me, um, brown skinned, working hard, creating these beautiful experiences. And then I can celebrate it by, you know, I guess giving a Yelp review, but you can't buy food for your kids with a fucking Yelp review. <laughs> so I want a tip. And um, it's, it's so, I, I mean, on, it gives me so much joy because it's like, you know, you'll have like a three or $400 bill. And in some cases, you know, you tip 500 bucks or 1,000 bucks and you close it and they're expecting $40. And I mean, the, I mean okay. I'll get a little emotional, but like they, they will come out to you and they're, it's transformational. And so it's such a great, it's so great. It's just like little things like that mean a lot to people. And just to be anonymously generous like that, I think is like, it's a great gift that I have the ability to do. That's why I do it. I love it. And it sounds like the experience of being seen and get, you are seen and the, the individual is seen and you're sharing in that. Well, together. I mean, okay, you know, what's funny is like 99% uh, of the time they don't say anything because they, they, they do the bill thing afterwards and they for sure can't pronounce my name. And so they for <laughs> sure have no fucking clue who it was that gave them the tip. It's fine. It's totally fine. But I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, my friends freak out. Now, it's caused tension actually because now when I go out with my friends, they know as well. And I've just made it very easy, which is like, hey, if we're going out, just like, let me just fucking pay. Just like, let's just not, it's, it's not, it's fine. Yeah. And uh, it makes it simpler. Yeah. Uh, I I'm, I'm want to dig into what you were describing about your upbringing and this unique position that you've gotten to where you don't feel that you covet money, but you see its power and, and the use that it has in, in furthering some opportunities for you. How did you develop that? How do, you, how do you distinguish between luck and skill? How do you, how do you end up in that position? So I, um, my parents craved money, meaning they, they needed it because it was, it, it, my dad was unemployed for long stretches of time. My mom was a sole breadwinner. She was a housekeeper, then she was a nurse's aide. Um, and so, and, you, and I would just see how she grinded. We didn't have a car for a long time. She takes the bus. We all take the bus. At, you know, when I got my first job, it was at Burger King. I take the money and I had to give it to my parents and we would buy bus passes. And, you know, I remember telling like some of my friends, I went to a very good high school, like uh, kind of like the rich high school, not the high school I should have gone to. I got, I was able to go to this different high school. And I would remember, tell, I would tell them like, hey, this is like, yeah, I, I, you know, I, they, I would be so ashamed that I worked at Burger King. Um, they would sometimes come by and I would just be like, oh, fuck. Like, uh, and then at some point, I, it was just, it was like this release moment where I was like, this is my life. Like, I just, I can't do anything about it. This is what it is right now. And I kind of had a sense that I could figure some stuff out later, but I didn't really know. And so I just accepted it. And then the minute I accepted it, I wasn't ashamed anymore. And then when I wasn't ashamed, I could start to actually be inside my head like, what really matters? So then what happened was there was these massive racial riots in Los Angeles. And not as if the fucking American government did anything about it, but the Canadian government was like, shit, let's get all these black and brown kids jobs. Because we don't want the Rodney King riots in Toronto and Ottawa and parts of Ontario. And so I was able to take all of my dad's rejection letters, call every single one, and one of them gave me a job. 
and I worked at this well-known telecommunication startup in Ottawa. Ottawa had a really burgeoning tech scene at the time. And I worked in this organization that was run by this really iconic guy, Terry Matthews. And he was a billionaire. And I was like, what the fuck is that word? Like, I mean, I didn't even know a fucking thousand air. Like, I was like, what is a billionaire? And this guy was risk on. And he was just so dynamic in the businesses he had started and how he viewed his place in the world. And I was enthralled. I was nine degrees away from him. But the cult of personality around him in that business, the lore, when it trickles down to you, was not about you know his conspicuous consumption or anything else. It was about Okay, we're launching this frame relay switch. Now we're going to buy this company. Okay, we're going to pivot the entire business to ATM. And you were just like, it was an amazing time. And so I took the bus to Newbridge. Complete luck that the controller of Newbridge would go from his nice neighborhood through this shitty neighborhood to get on the highway. And so he would see this guy standing by the bus. And eventually, he saw me inside the office. And one day, he stopped. He's like, you want to ride? You work in Newbridge? I'm like, yeah. And this guy, Sam Legg. So in the car, he was just he was in the front seat, like beside Terry. And he was able to tell me like how this guy thought about this. I was like, because I would read it in the paper. And I'd be like, why is he doing this? And, like, and he, so it just completely rewired what money was. For Terry Matthews, money was an instrument of change, right? He had a market cap. He's like, wow, that's $8 billion of change, $10 billion of change, $15 billion of change. Versus there was another guy building a company at the time. His name was Michael Copeland, who ran a company called Corel, also a billionaire. And he was the exact opposite. Had a messy divorce, married some trophy wife. He took this obscene, shiny glass from his building and covered its house in it. And so you had this, this really, this dichotomy of two different characters at that time in the 90s building really interesting businesses. Corel, which was a reasonable business. Newbridge, which was a reasonable business. They were both very successful, but they manifested money so totally differently. And I was like, I want to be this guy. You know, I want to be this mega compounder swashbuckling around trying to do really cool shit in the world. How do I do that? Mm -hmm.